It is a real pleasure today to introduce Murray Merce. What Murray is the uh, Senior Living Marketing Director for a company called Point Click Care. And Point Click Care is a vendor partner to the industry that has a variety of software options that help operators be better at what they do um, through technology. And Murray has an awesome background. We've had the privilege of having Murray on our campus. Uh, the very first year that we did a uh, uh, senior living presenter during hospitality week, Murray was our guy. Murray came out and he killed it. He was so incredible. He's been a very good friend of ours and helped us grow and develop and give us a little uh, PR to help us get our name out about what we're trying to do. So I am uh, just going to turn it over to Murray, let Murray tell you a little bit about his background and then launch. Thank you, Murray. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate you. Uh, two of my favorite people, Nancy and Darcy. Um, <laughs> hi, everybody. My name is Murray Mercier. I am the Senior Living Market Director uh, at Point Click Care. What that means is I guide, Point Click Care is a software company. It is the uh, leading cloud-based software provider to North America's long-term care, uh, post-acute care industries, which is skilled nursing, nursing homes traditional nursing homes, and senior living communities. We have more than 21,000 skilled nursing centers uh, that subscribe to our software, uh, and we've got more than 12,000 senior living communities that subscribe to our software. Uh, they rely on us to create and build innovative solutions that help them uh, become more efficient in all of the things that they have to do, which I'm going to tell you all about today. Uh, prior to joining Point Click Care, I've been here for 10 years, but prior to joining Point Click Care, I spent 15 years actually out in the community. So I love hearing that uh, part of your course is actually going out in the community. And honestly, the way that today started is is almost a perfect way to start because in a community, in a home, we just have to roll with the punches. And really the objective in a senior living environment is to just show up and live life as best we can hey, day in and day out. Yes, ma'am. Hey, you're not yeah. in presentation mode. We're actually reading here. Oh, you're reading my slide? Huh? I knew you. Oh. oh, there you go. How about that? That's it. There That's you long. go. Now you, now, you, now you know I'm now you know I'm reading some stuff. That's not fair. I'm I'm crushed. You weren't, you weren't supposed to see that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I do appreciate you all um, allowing me to come in and take some of your time to tell you about what it's like to be in a senior living community. So prior to joining Point Click Care, um, I spent about 15 years in the community. Uh, doing all kinds of jobs. I started in technology. My degree is in information systems, um, and I have a master's in business administration. But I tell you, what would have been the most helpful in my career in the community uh, was a degree in hospitality or any sort of formal training in hospitality. And since working with uh, Washington State and the Granger Cobb uh, Institute, I've come to realize that you know, thinking about senior living in terms of a long-term hospitality engagement uh, really makes sense. And, and we'll get into why. Um, but I'm going to take some time to tell you my story, uh, share with you exactly what caused me to become so engaged with the industry, uh, along with give you some insights into what it's like to work in a senior living organization, particularly the design of service coordination um, and what I've come to understand as extended hospitality. Um, my, I started building servers and networks for senior living communities before I moved into operations and community startups, and eventually to where I am today, acting as the subject matter expert for uh, the market to a large software organization. There are so many opportunities to explore uh, in senior living operations because they are literally like little cities. I mean, they've got really robust dining programs and there's um there's they you know sometimes they'll call them the cruise ship experience and there's really cool engagement opportunities and you don't have to worry about like making somebody happy at every moment of the day what what you get to do in a senior living environment is you get to deeply know the individuals of the community and not just the customer being the resident that lives there but the fellow staff members um, the family members of the residents, 
There are tons of third party service providers that come and interact in the community. Uh, one thing that got me really, uh, really kind of um, interested in the senior living experience is that when everybody comes together and, and doesn't just do the job in front of them, but really shares who they are as an individual, the community is stronger that way. Like, right. Think about any community that's popular. I live out in Denver, Colorado. It's a very popular city. Well, why is that? It's because the people that live here and the people that visit here have a great experience. It's enriched with culture. Um, it's a very strong city from an infrastructure perspective. We've got uh, great restaurants and we've got great transportation and the mountains are right there and the skiing and all that fun stuff. Uh, and that the experiences that we have within draw people there. It's the same thing in a senior living community. And hopefully you'll see some of that when you go visit the community um, the community near you is you'll 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 feel the experience you'll walk in and you'll feel uh, the interactions that people are having so even though i never expected to be here um, and i know this is darcy's favorite thing mm -hmm. uh, hi i'm murray and i love old people are the exact first words that i said when i met my wife for the first time that was my pickup line hi i'm murray and i love old people <laughs> Um, I can honestly say that if I hadn't discovered my passion for senior living and the world of senior living, I never would have met this wonderful person to spend the rest of my life with. Um, my journey in the industry actually started way back in the 80s uh, when senior housing had a <laughs> very different look than it does today. Back then, it was extremely healthcare focused, uh, very sterile. And this is uh, what your traditional nursing home was. So lots of people, albeit doing the best that they could, were segregated from their lives because they had a need for physical and cognitive support. And I'm going to talk to you specifically about memory care here in a little while, also because that holds a very special place in my, ho in my heart. Um, but senior care uh, and nursing homes was essentially born during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, when young people when were moving away from their families uh, for careers in the city, leaving aging parents and grandparents with no support in their homes. So the government did a bunch of things, and they've kind of tried to repeat history over and over again, uh, including starting Social Security. Social Security was born out of the need to be able to help older people try and be successful living in their home. Well, if you have mobility challenges or you've got memory challenges and um, you know you might be able to take a couple dollars and pay for somebody to come in and help you do your laundry and make your meals and get your groceries, but you're isolated. So that has never quite worked. And it's something that we try to do over and over again. In order to live successfully, to put more life into your years, you really need that human interaction in order to do that, which is why senior living is such a cool uh, opportunity from a hospitality pers uh, perspective. Um, the problem was that the government gave a bunch of money to help start these nursing homes to hospitals. There was actually a point in time when they were trying to decide, do we give the money to churches and let them start? nursing homes or do we give it to hospitals and let them do it? And they chose hospitals for fear of risk, right? We're, we're, when we're thinking about another person's safety, we're always risk adverse. When we're thinking about our own safety, we're a lot more willing to take risk. Um, and so they gave the money to the hospitals because they didn't want people getting hurt and they wanted them to be as safe as possible. Um, but the hospitals only know one way of kind of doing things. And that's creating a very safe but sterile environment for people to live. So I was a kid in the 80s running around the nursing home because my grandmother was running the nursing home and if my parents didn't have child care, I'd go to work with her, with my grandmother. And I thought it was so awesome. Like I, I didn't understand what I was looking at. I was running around and climbing all over people's laps and we were watching TV and they were feeding me candy and we were playing games. It was a really cool experience as a young person um, because I didn't really know what was actually happening. And we've actually come a long way since those early days uh, of hospital style living for older people that um, provides more of an opportunity to stay engaged with life. 
uh, one of the big um, transitions was in the late 80s, uh, a company called Sunrise Senior Living, which is a national provider. They've got more, I think now they've got more than 200 communities across the country. Um, it was a very mission-based and they're like, hey, you know, living in a hospital isn't so cool. We should create something different that still meets the needs of the activities of daily living, um, help, help getting out of bed, help putting on your clothes, making sure you're getting the right nutrition, getting to your doctor's, doctor's visits, taking all your medications, but goes further than that and creates a total living experience with people that can come together and share their gifts and live together uh, more successfully. And that is actually the mission statement that has stuck with me since I started in this industry, which is we share our gifts to create communities that celebrate life. Um, the biggest transition to the base culture of the industry came when we realized that power of community, that power of relationships, the power of an individual, no matter what their role or job title is in the community, my favorite thing to do once I learned a few things working in the community was say, when I would hire somebody, I would interview them for a role, uh, a dining role, a activities role, a, um, a care role. And, and we would do the interview and then I would hire them and I would say, great, we're throwing your entire job title out the window. What are you good at? Do you like, do you have a special talent? Like, do you play music? Um, or do you have, do you like art? Or is there another area that you would wish to, to give back to the community in that way? Um, and that resulted in a really successful uh, first assisted living that I opened uh, called Aspen House. Welcome to Aspen House. This was a project that I started back in 2008. And it was my first attempt at an assisted living community that was totally void of the healthcare institution and the healthcare experience. Um, from a business perspective, well, some things I want you to take note of is like, you don't see any nurses stations, right? Um, you don't see white hallways. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in the nursing home, I didn't realize this till later, but I used to see things called wheelchair ties. Whereas if a resident's getting a little bit unruly or or anxious and they're scooting down the hall, they would literally take a tie and tie them to the railing. But it was for fear of the person possibly injuring themselves. We blew all of that away. And we took extra special care and time to really understand the people that were in the community and to really understand the value of that long-term hospitality. Um, when you are given the opportunity to know your know your community at a very deep level, some very special things start to happen. Uh, when I opened this assisted living, um, compared to other assisted livings that would have a very high degree of staff turnover. Um, a, one reason for that is the traditional model of assisted living was, I need you to be a caregiver, you know, the entire time that you're in the community. But we said, that's not actually what we're trying to do here. Everybody in this community has the opportunity to give as well as receive. And that really changed the notion of what it was like to be in the community. Um, I remember I was struggling with a business challenge. Um, this was a startup business and I had to make it profitable. And I was sitting at the kitchen table because I didn't have an office or a desk and we didn't have nurses stations and all that stuff. And I was struggling with the problem and my resident sitting next to me who was 85 plus years old, congestive heart failure, he was on oxygen, um, you know, 12 different comorbidities, 12 different diagnoses that, diagnoses that were ailing him on, you know, more than 15 medications. He turned to me and he said, I was a CEO for 40 years. Could I possibly help you solve this business challenge? I was 26 years old. So I was like, Heck yes, you can help me solve this business challenge. And that really opened my eyes. Um, and I have seen this transition happen across the industry where the community is much more willing to accept that, hey, all of our challenges, all of our successes, all of our wins, all of our losses, we do it as a community. Uh, so one cool thing that we did was we didn't have staff meetings. We had community meetings where everybody was invited and we would talk about all the challenges that we had. Um, another interesting thing is when you think about assisted living, nobody's like, hey, I want to move to an assisted living, right? Um, and that was true for many of the residents that you see in these pictures. 
some of the biggest naysayers or some of the, the biggest resistors to actually coming to live in our community turned into our biggest promoters. Um, and that happened because we were able to educate one another on what each one of us needed. And they ended up being more engaged when a resident was confused or um, was having maybe um, some memory loss uh, going on and that the residents would engage with each other and tell stories and read magazines and play games um, that would help bring the person back to the present day. Uh, and it was just a really cool thing to see happen. You know, you think about traditional hosp hospitality settings. I'm not sure I would be able to um, handle it. I was actually in Nashville at a conference this week and I walked in to check in at the hotel and there was this guest that was just going crazy at the hotel manager um, and, uh, and, and wasn't too happy. And I was just sitting there like, oh my gosh. But when you're in that short term kind of resort engagement, right? You, you are trying your best to make sure everything is pristine, everything is right. That is not this. Uh, you don't have to. And I, 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 I certainly encourage assisted living not to hold themselves to the level of perfection. We're not trying to create perfect. We're just trying to create um, as as <laughs> as good of a daily life, day in and day out, as we can. Um, so there's some things that have guided the the principles of senior living and assisted living and memory care specifically to help enrich the experience of the people and the workers within. The first one is transitioning to what's called a person-centered model of service delivery, and I'll tell you, even though I'm talking about senior living philosophy and logic, these things are very applicable and I have found them to be very applicable across my life with my family, uh, with my wife, with my friends. Um, when you creating community, the, the, the core foundation of creating community is really the same no matter where you are. Um, and person-centered approaches certainly had a part to play in this. And that was the process by which you um, deeply understand an individual. Uh, not just their physical needs and their cognitive needs, but what are your existential needs? What do you like to eat? What time do you like to wake up in the morning? Do you, are you a night owl? Um, do you go to bed early? Uh, you know, all these different personal preferences. And when you take the time to learn that about somebody, uh, which you have a lot of time to do in a senior living environment, um, the experience just becomes better for all, all the way around. If I know, if I'm walking into your um, into your apartment in the morning to help assist you with your physical needs. If I don't know your personal preferences as an individual, I'm likely not to have a great encounter with you, right? That's why we see a lot of flustered situations in hospital settings and nursing homes. It's not because the person's not foundationally cared for, it's that there's some other need, some other need from a Maslow's hierarchy of care need to feel safe, uh, to feel pretty, to have your physical needs met, um, to not, be hungry, you know, all, all of those components um, that go on top of it that that give you an opportunity to just connect with humans on a, on a deeper level. The industry is attempting to take that into a deeper uh, state called person directed services. And that's giving the person total control of their dignity and their daily lives. Um, and it's something that's really cool. It's very progressive. So not everybody has gotten there, but even the healthcare arena as a whole is trying to step into better patient experience. Um, you know, the irony of the world, the word patient is the definition is willing to put up with delays, which makes sense, right? You go into a hospital, you do nothing but sit and wait all the time, right? Um, so transitioning that and giving people a better experience throughout the entire health con healthcare continuum through what's called value-based care, um, which some of you might be experiencing if you are um, with a health network like Kaiser or um, United Healthcare or somebody like that, where they really try to know you deeply and share that information across their, their healthcare ecosystem. It's very similar in a senior living world. Um, there's language is, uh, language matters, right? The words we use matter. And it, coming from the healthcare side of things, there's this idea that the patient receives and the person giving the care does nothing but give. Uh, 
I realized very quickly that in order to be successful in a long-term community setting, everybody needed the opportunity to give as well as receive. So a care partnership includes that ability to give as well as receive between two people. And when you think about any relationship that's successful, none of them are one-sided, right? So thinking about who, who in your life is a partner to you. Um, is something that's really cool to carry forward into into the work into the work world. I miss the community a lot. Um, the corporate world isn't exactly as fulfilling to me. It's a lot more demanding. Um, but when I figured out that our my primary responsibility was to live life as best we could day in and day out, it really hit me hard, and it was um, something that I became very engaged with. And all the stress went away. It's like it's like this is just the coolest thing to do. I, I leave my house and I go to my other house and I hang out with these people that I like. Um, and it, and it's, a, it's a really cool career from my perspective anyways. Uh, another component of a successful senior living operation is giving a person the opportunity to participate in their plan. When every resident that lives in a senior living community has a what's called a service plan or a care plan. And in our instance, we refer to it as an I care plan. Traditionally, back back in the day, and and still a lot of assisted livings that are out there today, you'll have a nurse or a resident care director that sits there and asks a bunch of questions and takes a bunch of notes and creates this this service plan. Uh, a better model is to have the resident actually write their own service plan, and not only taking into account the physical and emotional components of a plan of service, but extending it into what are your environmental needs. Do you like it hot? Do you like it cool? Um, do you like it the shades drawn or do you like the sun coming through the windows? Those environmental and social impacts are actually, they, they have a high degree of impact on a person's ability to live successfully. So now looking a little bit deeper into memory care. So at our community in Aspen House, I actually had all of our residents living intermingled together. So we had independent living residents <clears throat> that were just living in their apartment. We had assisted living residents that were primarily needed physical support. Uh, and then we had our, our memory care residents who um, have a high degree of either short-term or long-term memory loss. And it was really cool being able to intermingle all of those people together. The traditional model of care for memory care is to have a building or a locked unit inside of a building where you put all of your memory care residents. Imagine taking, I don't know, 15 to 30 of the most complex cognitively declined individuals and putting them in a thousand square feet and then being like, okay, go be successful. It's really hard because the, the emotion can go one direction or the other really fast and, and they play off of one another. But it's, 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 a part of, it's a part of the world today and it may be that the community that you go see uh, does, have, does in fact have a memory care uh, unit. Now, I really liked interacting and this was my favorite group of individuals to problem solve with. Um, Several of my residents had uh, what's called Lewy body uh, dementia alongside Parkinson's, which is a very common um, disease combination, uh, or they would have Alzheimer's. Um, there's about 15 different types of memory care diseases that occur, uh, but everybody's different. And at any given moment, something different is happening. And so having the opportunity to be like, okay, what's really going on right now? It used to be that we would treat a lot of the memory care instances through medication, calming medication, um, antipsychotic medication. Now the irony around a lot of the medications that exist for people that do have cognitive decline is that they actually, the, one of the major side effects in most of them are hallucinations. So I've already got somebody that's in cognitive decline and then I'm giving them a medication that increases the risk of a hallucination and it just puts it in a weird situation. What we would do instead is we would really try to understand the person deeply, their background, where they came from. Um, and then we would really put ourselves inside of their reality. Um, one of my residents, Mary Lou, she had Lewy body and Parkinson's and it was very frequent in the evening that she would think she was supposed to go pick up her girls from the bus stop. Um, 
old school treatment might have been like, here's a lorazepam, just get some rest. We'll see you in the morning when you're feeling better. Uh, I loved the opportunity to go sit with Mary Lou and talk to her and be like, oh, how, how old are your daughters? And uh, what, what grade are they in? What are they studying at school? And when, and this is cool, like I was getting paid for this. And, and I would just sit there and talk to her. And eventually she would work her way back to the present time. Um, and it was just such a fulfilling experience to be able to do that with her. Uh, but all of us look at reality in terms of what, not, what, what are, not, not what are the state of the things as they are appear to be, uh, but rather than, rather than as one might wish them to be. There's this concept in memory care support called therapeutic, therapeutic fibbing. And the idea is, is that if, if the lie doesn't cause harm, then it's perfectly fine in the, in the situation. Um, and it's something that we used a lot. Communication is key, not only in a memory care environment, but everywhere in life. I constantly miscommunicate with my very intelligent coworkers at Point Click Care, let alone when I was in the community um, and, and having communication with people that had cognitive uh, impairment. So developing good communication skills is just good period, but making sure that we have good communication with those who have Alzheimer's is even more critical. Um, you know, talking slow, uh, you know, asking questions, uh, not yes, no questions, but asking uh, deliberate questions, um, giving the opportunity for the person to think uh, are all good ways to communicate when you're, when you're talking with somebody that has um, Alzheimer's or, or cognitive impairment. And the other thing to remember is that in those situations, it really is on us to do most of that work. So what are some tips for successful communication? And again, with, a, with somebody with cognitive decline um, or just anybody out in the world, bolstering self-worth is always great. You look wonderful. Your voice is beautiful. I, you know, I love the way that you make toast and eggs in the morning. All of these simple things really lift somebody up. I quickly, be, I quickly realized, some through training and some through experience, that it, it only takes about three seconds to have an interaction with a person that either leaves them better off than they were, um, neutral to where they were, or worse off than, 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 than you found them. Um, so being very aware of that, I think, in a hospitality environment is very important. Calming and reassuring. Uh, meaningful activities, not just bingo, beyond bingo, right? Um, and joining them in their journey, like I was talking about Mary Lou. Uh, it's a really cool way to connect with people. And again, true for somebody that has cognitive impairment and just all of our, our friends and family and colleagues around us in everyday life as well. Some common slips that occur when working with individuals that have cognitive impairment, uh, talking louder, giving commands, asking, don't you remember type questions, arguing truth, right? I talked about that therapeutic fibbing. Um, and a number one is don't ask questions if you won't accept the answer. Uh, and again, I find that true even when my wife are, and I are having conversations. Um, active listening is always a good idea in any situation, taking the time. And one of the cool things about working in a senior living community is you generally do have the time uh, to sit and listen. Um, so it's, 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 it's a great experience for those who, who like relationships and communication and all those fun things. Um, some of the behavior changes that occur when people go through uh, cognitive impairment is they can easily become irritable, uh, high degrees of anxiety over the memory loss that they are um, experiencing, which tends to drive them into depression. You don't want to avoid it. Um, life is hard and it's, it's okay to experience the ups and downs. Uh, and you have that flexibility in a senior living environment from a hospitality perspective. When you get to later stages of dementia, people are oftentimes extremely angry, agitated, uh, will show aggression. They'll have the hallucination, hallucinations and sleep disturbances. But again, those were the situations that I, I really enjoyed engaging with residents and figuring out what would work. I had a resident that um, every afternoon would run out of his room and he'd be yelling, there's bugs on the walls, there's spiders, there's spiders, there's spiders. And 
I remember the nurse, I walked in and the nurse, my nurse was talking to the physician and the physician was like, okay, we probably need to bring him in. We need to adjust his antipsychotic medication. And I was kind of like, eh, I wonder really what's going on. So the next afternoon, I just went in and sat with the resident and we just chatted. Um, I, I gave him a beer and we were watching some TV. And then the construction next door started. And sure enough, these bugs started crawling down the wall. So he was actually right. But because he was cognitively impaired from a diagnosis perspective, we were only looking at one area. Um, and so it was really cool to just kind of sit down and figure out what, what exactly was going on. There was another situation where um, a woman every night was very, uh, she would wake up in the morning and she'd say, you know, the aliens were coming to get me last night. The aliens were coming to get me last night. Very similar situation. The doctor wanted to prescribe more meds. We decided to have a sleepover. Uh, so we brought in ice cream, pop popcorn. We watched some movies. About 1230 in the morning, there was a semi that was parked across the street. And it was one of these really cool semis that had all these like purple and yellow and red and orange lights. And the driver would turn it on and it just lit up. And he just, he would leave it running to let it warm up or whatever. And that's what she was seeing. So again, not everything is what it seems. Uh, and it, it's really, it was a really cool experience to watch that happen. Um, and not just take, not just take it from a, uh, from a medical view, but actually look at the environment and see what was happening around uh, to understand what was happening with that resident. Um, from a behaviors perspective, uh, and again, cognitive impaired or not, uh, leading with empathy is always a good idea, trying to meet somebody where they are. Um, answering repeated questions calmly. I had a resident, Renee, he would walk in every five minutes and he would ask, what's for dinner? Uh, and Renee didn't always like me, but the cool thing was is that he would not well he would forget about the encounter and he would come back in and I would get to try again. So if I wasn't successful the first time, I usually got it the second or the third. Um, understanding or responding to emotion is always key uh, when, when you're working with any individual. Trying touch or gestures and, and redirecting activities are, are also helpful. Creating moments of joy is a critical aspect of hospitality inside of senior living. Um, there was a adult day center in India and there was a woman that kept getting frustrated, but she was a former mathematician and they figured that out. They realized that and they gave her a piece of chalk and a chalkboard and they had her teach math to the rest of the residents that were interested in partaking. Um, and she was suddenly back engaged with life. So having the opportunity to help sell somebody else engage with life, uh, is something that I found to be extremely special in this environment. Now, the cool thing is that senior living isn't all boring. Um, I have had the opportunity to travel to the United Kingdom and um, help assisted living communities in the United Kingdom um, figure out how to, how to operate better. I've had the opportunity to do it in Canada. Um, we've got communities out in Australia and China. The cool thing about this is that Senior living, the, the, the goals and what we're trying to accomplish is the same around the world. There's a, also a lot of very cool people that are involved in this. Uh, Seth Rogen and his wife have a, um, have a, have a hilarity for charity it is a, a not-for-profit group. And they are heavily invested into medications that, that can potentially help curb the onset of Alzheimer's. So there could be a time and there are a couple meds that are already going through um, going through approvals that could essentially help eliminate uh, Alzheimer's and cognitive impairment for future uh, for future generations. So that um, is definitely a cool thing. But I do want to take a, a minute here and hopefully this will work with the sound and everything. I do want to take a minute to show you a video of my friend Henry. Uh, and what can happen when you deeply understand an individual and get to know them. So let me know if this is, if you can hear this okay. Oops. Hi, Papa. Hi, Papa. Huh? How you doing? I'm all right. I'm fine. Who, Wait. Who am I? I'm Okay, it's Cherry. 
How long has he been in the nursing home? Uh, approximately 10 years. He was having seizures and my mother couldn't handle him at home. Of course it affected me greatly because he was always, you know, fun loving, singing, you know, every occasion he would come out with a song, no matter where he was. I remember as a child, he used to walk us down the street, me and my brother, and he would stop and do singing in the rain. He would have us jumping and swinging around poles. He was, you know, he was good. He was always into music, you know, always loved singing, dancing. His name is Henry Drea. Uh-huh. And I'm looking more or less for religious music for him. Okay. Because he enjoys music and he always quotes in the Bible. So I'd rather have that for him. We first see Henry inert, maybe depressed, unresponsive, and almost unalive. Henry. Yeah. Henry. Yes, yeah, so. I found your music. Uh, you want you want your music now? Well, not you, okay, let's, let's try your music, okay? And then you tell me if it's too loud or not. Then he is given an iPod containing, we know, his favorite music. Mm -hmm. And immediately he, he lights up, his face assumes expression, his eyes open wide, he, uh, he starts to, um, to sing and to rock and to move his arms and he's being animated by the music. And he used to always sit on the unit with his head like this. He didn't really talk to much people and then when I introduced the music to him, this is his, his reaction every since. <laughs> Philosopher Kant once called music the quickening art, and Henry is being quickened, he's being brought to life. Yeah. I'm going to take the music for one second, okay? Just huh? to ask you a few questions. Okay? Thank you. I'm going to give it back to you. Uh huh. Okay. The effect of this doesn't stop because when the, uh, the, the headphones are taken off, uh, Henry, normally mute and virtually unable to answer the simplest yes or no questions, is quite voluble. Henry? Yeah? Um, do you like the iPod? Do you like the music you're hearing? Yes. Tell me about your music. Well, I don't, I don't, don't, I don't have one, I mean. Do you like music? Yeah, I'm crazy about music. You play beautiful music, beautiful sound. Did beautiful. You? Did you play music when you were, uh, were you, did you like music when you were young? Yes, yes, I went to big dances and things. W what was your favorite music when you were young? Uh, well, uh, I guess, uh, well, Cab Calloway was my number one band guy I liked. They did the whole of the holiday, the holiday, the holiday, the holiday, the holiday, the holiday. Uh, what was your fav favorite Cab Calloway song? Oh. I'll be home there for Christmas. Oh, you can count plans on me with plenty of snow, mistletoe, present, wrap around you free. Ow! So, in some sense, Henry is restored to himself. He is uh, uh, remembered. Uh, who he is, and uh, he's, he's reacquired his, his identity for a while through the power of music. What, what does music do, do to you? It gives me the feeling of love. No, no man, figure right now the world needs to come into music singing. You got beautiful music in. Beautiful, oh, lovely. And uh, I feel the band of love, the dream. Lord came to me, made me holy. I'm a holy man. So he gave me this sound. The other day, I meet you. Let me see. Rosalie, won't you love me? Rosalie, won't you be sweet and kind? With this beautiful new technology, you can have all the music which is significant for you in something as big as a matchbox or, or whatever. So, not really new technology now to us. But you can see when you give a person the opportunity to participate in life, 
even when they are socially deemed as maybe not not able to do those things, but you give them the opportunity, you deeply know them, you give them an opportunity to participate in in their world, um, there are amazingly powerful outcomes that come from that. Uh, and that's something I will always carry with me uh, and will likely return eventually back to the community um, as, as, my, as my, 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 my favorite place. It's a really cool time in the, not only the senior living uh, industry, but in the healthcare industry as a whole, as I said, because we are paying a lot more attention to experience and we are putting a lot more value on experience and not just putting people on a conveyor belt of, of healthcare services and not just, okay, you have too much physical or cognitive dependencies. I'm going to put you over here and segregate you from the rest of the world. We have to keep these folks engaged in the world. In fact, if we don't keep the baby boomer generation engaged with the economy, uh, engaged with the climate challenges, we won't have enough people. We won't have enough people to sustain the economy and, and to be able to sustain uh, the, the battle against climate change. So it's becoming very pivotal. Uh, we're about to have an upside down uh, population for the first time in a very long time. Um, once the Once the baby boomers um, go through this phase of the life and eventually die, we're going to be or a shrinking population, which is crazy to think about because we've been an expanding population for so long. So it's a really time to get into it because it's not all about healthcare. Um, that's just one piece of it. And in fact, in a lot of ways, it's not even the most important piece. Uh, you think about how you go to the doctor today and they, you know, do all their tests and they make their suggestions and you talk to them and they want you to like steer towards the best possible healthcare outcome. But in some instances, we're going to make a decision to do something differently. And just because you've gotten to a certain age in life or a certain point of physical or cognitive dependency doesn't mean you should lose that right uh, to live life in an engaged way as you want to do it as an individual. Um, the other cool thing that has come along is the technology. Healthcare has traditionally been about 20 years behind the rest of the world from a technology perspective, um, but that is rapidly changing. And a lot of that has to do with the, the population shrinking um, upcoming. We need to be more efficient at understanding each other deeply and being able to sustain the communication of that deep understanding to the rest of the community, the rest of the healthcare community, the rest of the home community, uh, the rest of the services community, so that we can all be set up to have better experiences. Um, I mentioned uh, earlier that you know, it used to be that you would walk into a room and be like, man, I hope I get this right. Uh, but now there's a technology in your hand. You can walk in, you can know a person uh, before you even get in the room and you'll have a better shot of having a great experience. To be honest, who would want to walk in and wake somebody up and have a bad, ex bad experience and go back and do it again the next day? You, that. That's a big reason why the turnover was so crazy in our industry before. But a lot of that has changed. And if we take the time to understand each other more deeply, uh, we set ourselves up for a uh, better opportunity for success. Uh, this is my friend, Clive. Uh, Clive also had um, Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's. And I can, I can share all of this because uh, Clive has passed away since, since then. And uh, HIPAA doesn't apply once somebody passed away. But uh, Clive... Um, was nonverbal uh, or uh, very uh, low verbal uh, capabilities. But I remember he was sitting in his wheelchair looking out the window and uh, another family member from the community walked in and they were like, is that Clive? And I'm like, yeah. And they were like, um, Clive invented a device that was implanted into my child's head that stopped seizures from happening and made it made my child's life possible. Um, uh, they would have passed away if, if they hadn't gotten the seizures under control. So just because we get older doesn't mean we shouldn't have the same opportunity to celebrate our life. Uh, it might look a little bit different and it might be in a different environment and, you know, we might not be doing the crazy things we were doing when we were young, um, but there's still a lot of opportunity to have a lot of fun 
and craziness. I had the opportunity to go back into a community when COVID hit. My company was very understanding. They said, hey, if you've got frontline experience, go back into the community uh, or do it if you want. So I, the next day I picked up the phone. There was a memory care down the street that had an 85% infection rate of COVID. Um, they had had several deaths and I was like, heck yeah, get me in there. So went in, had to tow PPE because we didn't exactly know what we were dealing with. And I can tell you that it was just such a vibrant community of people living together as best they could day in and day out. Um, so I hope maybe you might consider this uh, arena as well as, as a profession or might even just show some interest. But what I would ask is when you do go into the community to hang out for a day, Share, share your story, share yourself, share who you are, engage with the people around you. Um, it's just a wonderful experience. And I, I'm, I'm so glad each one of you gets to go have it. I do get one very specific question each time I do this presentation uh, with, with the students. And that is, how do you deal with the death of the individuals in the community? I can honestly say one of the biggest things that I am grateful for in having the opportunity to work in this industry for the last 25 years is understanding the aging process. And just because it's the last chapter of life doesn't mean it can't still be awesome. And even if you're in a wheelchair with a five minute memory, you can still live engaged till your last breath. And we need more people to, to engage and give these folks the opportunity to do that. Um, so honestly, uh, you, feel mo you feel more good vibes about it than anything else at the end of the day. Um, but I'm curious if you all have any questions about what it's like to be in a community and, and live life alongside these residents. And I usually, I usually, there I can hear you now, but I usually like to look at my audience. So it was a little difficult talking to you all today without seeing you. Can, can you hear us now? Yes, I can. Okay, Julie, go. Mm -hmm. um, since you enjoyed being in the community so much, what made you go to the corporate side of it? Yeah, so I, um, I wanted to see if I could bring my learnings of deinstitutionalization, of the importance of community, of the importance of relationship to a bigger audience. I had 15 residents and then my biggest community, I had 250 residents. And it was just really great seeing the impact of changing the mindset of community living and that, that how big that was. And so I wanted to, I wanted, honestly, I wanna change the world. <laughs> so that's what led me to join Point Click Care, which is the largest technology partner uh, to the industry. And we've got, uh, you know, we've got a global impact. Um, so that's why I chose to join Point Click Care because I saw a lot of the mission uh, that I was trying to achieve in the in the corporate organization that Point Click Care was driving. We're very mission driven, even though we're you know we're a six billion dollar company. But I'll tell you, everybody standing around me, the, the other twenty four hundred employees here are driving that same mission across skilled nursing nursing homes. Um, now we're, we've got a hospital division and an insurance division. Um, I run the senior living division. Um, and so I just saw this opportunity to spread the word and have a greater impact on the world. Marie, one question I have about the, um, you know, you talked, you brought, you brought up the piece about death and that I, mm -hmm. that is, that is an uncomfortable topic for a lot of mm -hmm. people. Um, and I guess the one, the one thing about it, um, and you answered it, it addressed it perfectly. But I guess the one thing, and I, because I know you a little bit, um, you know, I think part of the perception is, is that when people die, we have to be super stoic yeah. or, you know, we don't have to pretend like we care kind yeah. of, that's not professional. Nope. I, I, I'm going to say you shed a few, few tears in your time and it was probably not only okay, but necessary. It was, but quite honestly, so my first resident, the first resident that passed away, and mind you, I was 26 years old, and I like this this group of 15 residents, and 
when I first started, the average length of living in an assisted living was about eight, 16 to 18 months. We, we, got, we, we were getting these residents to more than three years because they were engaged with life. A lot of times what you'll see is a disengaged person, a person with nothing to do will choose to die. Um, but a person that has loved ones around them, that has opportunities to engage, you'll see the most wonderful things. The first resident that passed away did, did crush me. But every single one after that, um, it, any tears were actually tears of joy. I do have an interesting story because this happens in healthcare. Um, when people are at the end of life, they go on hospice. Um, which you may be familiar with. It's, it's a service that's free. Uh, the doctor prescribes it and um, hospice comes in. And a lot of times the, the person will be prescribed morphine to ease the pain of dying. Uh, we had an accidental double dose of morphine, which that resident who helped me with all the business challenges, he was the CEO of a dental practice. He was the one we accidentally double dosed. He passed away. I had to pick up the phone and call his son and said, this is what happened. Your father passed away. And I, you know, my company was like, all right, let's get the lawyers. Let's like get ready. I'll, ne I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, Murray, you gave my father the best last chapter of his life that he could have ever wished for. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. No, and none of it matters. I mean, today, tomorrow, next month, he was in congestive heart failure. Generally on a hospice, you're going to live for three months, um, though I've seen people live for years in the right environment. Um, but in his situation, he was very near death. And because of the experience that our community was able to give him, his family was actually um, at peace. And that gave me like, I, like, I can't explain it. You're going to make me cry, but um, yeah. it gave me the biggest sense of peace that I could have ever experienced in that situation, which is really what made me understand the power of community and the power of people engaging with people who have physical and cognitive support needs. Have any of you had any experience in an assisted living setting? Do you have grandparents or family members that have, that have gone through any senior care situations? No. Uh, couple nods. Okay. Well, it is. It's a great community. So, so just make sure you engage uh, when you when you get there, and don't be shy, because um, even one conversation is is can be very powerful for the folks living in those in those places. Okay. Anything great. else for Murray before we let him get on with this evening? Because he's about three hours ahead of us, I think, somewhere. Just one, but you're good. Oh, you're just one now? Oh, yeah, not, yeah. I, I not got on the East Coast or not, not oh, still in Nashville? I, I ran <laughs> home. I ran home for you. So okay. apologize for being a little tired today, and I hope you all have a, a great rest of your semester. I, I do have to give Murray one plug before I let him hang up. Um, that guitar hanging behind you is not there by accident. Uh, Murray is part of a band. And um, and a, a really good band, actually, and that's one of his hobbies and passions. Tell us a little bit about your, your band, Murray, and then I'll yeah. let you go. Strange Americans. Uh, we've been together for 14 years. Again, another just great community that I've had the opportunity to engage with. We've, we have been coast to coast. We've got a bunch of albums. They're off on Spotify. If you are into Americana rock and roll, that's what we play. So always, uh, thanks always for the plug, Nancy. I appreciate you. Well, as the mother of a bunch of musicians, I know that's a, you know, you got to take those plugs where you can get them. So there anyway, you go. Murray, thank, thank you. you for your thank time. You, thank you. We're always yep. blessed to have you with us. Have thank a good so evening. Much. We'll talk you again too. soon. Bye-bye.